today on the Quantum Leap Podcast, we are very fortunate to have with us from one of my favorite episodes of Quantum Leap, John D'Aquino. You know him as Frank LaMotta from Jimmy and Deliver Us From Evil. He was also in the final episode of Quantum Leap, and he wrote an episode of Quantum Leap, The Beast Within. Thank you for joining us so much. Oh, my pleasure. And just uh, also, I think Tommy Thompson's name is on that episode. I I had a lot to do with that episode, but Tommy and I wrote it together. All right. Tommy Thompson, they're one of their wonderful writers and uh, co-producer. Could you start out by telling the listeners a little bit about your experience with Quantum Leap? It's kind of magical. Um, I actually auditioned, I believe, three or four times the show. I think three times. Felt like I had very good auditions and didn't get the job. And then uh, there was a particular Friday where I was up for... Uh, a movie called Flight of the Intruder with Mel Gibson and Robert Downey Jr. And I was also, I don't know how seriously in contention, but I was being considered for uh, Godfather 3. And um, yeah, it's been something I've been really working for for a while. And on that given Friday, uh, I got a phone call saying, you know, no to both of those. <laughs> I was just really low and uh, thought, oh, God, just give me some place to put my thoughts, some place to... To work, something to work on. And on that Monday, an audition popped up for the episode of Jimmy. But my first response was, well, I've already gone in there and I've already given my best three times. I mean, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to have that possible rejection a fourth time? I'm so glad I decided to do it. And, you know, normally if they're calling you back, you know, all actors' egos aside, they like you. They're just trying to find the right fit. Well, this, this I think, was a great fit for me. It really, that particular part had a, felt like it had my heart. And so on that Monday, I believe I auditioned, and I can't remember if it was a day later that I was told I, I got it. And it was just a magical ride. I can talk for a while on it, but I'll just say the one thing that I do remember is before the show even was completed, before the episode was wrapped, uh, I was getting phone calls. My agent was getting calls from NBC, from Universal, from Don Belisario himself. And everybody was requesting meetings. And I think sometimes, you know, all of us actors, we wait for that, that moment where it's the perfect marriage of yourself, your your DNA, and the right character. That was a really good fit for me. It's one of my personal favorites out of uh, Quantum Leap. It's when you think about Quantum Leap, you think about that episode, Jimmy, and of course the Deliver Us from Evil, which is almost a sequel to Jimmy in a way. And um, besides Scott and Dean, you're probably the actor that's on the show the most times. I don't know about that. You know, Bradley Silverman, who played the mirror image, and he's Jimmy. Right. Um, he and I are still friendly. Um, we're, we've been remained very close, ironically, and that's another gift from the show. Um, but he always reminds me that he did one more episode than I did. Oh, yeah, he was in shock theater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, you still do uh, see him every once in a while, keep in contact? We had breakfast. We had a nice brunch breakfast together not long ago. He's doing very well. He's a pretty amazing fellow. He always has been. And uh, love him very dearly. We remain brothers from that show. I remember him literally. Uh, we were <laughs> first day on set, and uh, he said, where are you going now? And I said, I'm going to go back to my dressing room and change for the next scene. He said, I will go with you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And then when he, it was time for him to change, now you will go with me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much it. We were uh, stuck together from that point forward, and we have really enjoyed a very good brotherhood from that show. It's been one of the great gifts. That really uh, is nice to hear, because you, you hope the people you see that uh, get along on screen are friendly in real life, and when they are, it makes you feel better as a fan, I think. Mm -hmm. He'd be a fun interview for you in the future. Okay, <laughs> uh, hopefully that would be great if I can get in contact with him. So really, when you were on two other Don Belisario shows before Quantum Leap, and that didn't help you get the roles the first time, you still had audition. You know, I'm trying to think of the shows that I was on. One would have been maybe Magnum before. Is that what you're talking about? Right, Magnum P.I. and Tequila and Benetti. Was Tequila and Benetti? No, I think Tequila and Benetti was after, wasn't it? Uh, I, would have, I would have bet after. Okay. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was after. But, um, well, uh, Don was not associated. Well, he was the creator, but he wasn't associated with Magnum when I did it. Uh. So that was a different producer at the time. 
and then tequila. But oh, you know what? Yeah, the, um, God, I'm getting all these confused now. Okay, the beast was in it. They got it. No, because I, um, I guess I did get the full credit on that one. It's been so long ago because now I'm thinking that since you brought up tequila and Benetti, I think I helped Tommy write that episode a little bit. So I'm not sure. I do see Tommy Thompson still. I'll have to ask him because I'm really confused at this point. But um, a great, great writer and a dear friend of mine, Tommy Thompson, and I actually drove out to California together years ago. And uh, and then yeah. <laughs> And the first time he was ever on the set of Quantum Leap, I believe, was as my guest. And all on his own, without my doing anything, certainly, he became one of their top writer-producers. Pretty amazing. What was the process like for you with The Beast Within? Uh, Did you have to go in and pitch the story idea and then get approval? And then what was the writing process like for you? It's kind of funny because uh, I had, (laughs) you know how Hollywood goes, I had pitched my uh, one idea. Uh, that I had for the show to a producer that will go unnamed, and um, and I but I got busy on another series performing, acting in, in another show, and so I, I I had no time to do anything else. But I was at the Hollywood Bowl to see one of Frank Sinatra's last concerts, and in front of me was a girl, an actress that I knew, and she said she was doing Quantum Leap, and because I knew everybody, I said, oh, which which episode are you doing, and who's directing, and she started telling me the episode that I pitched. <laughs> and that was that was kind of tough, but um, you know, Don makes sure he takes care of everybody, and um, I had this other opportunity to to write the Beast Within, which was a real a personal experience for me to write. I just felt very connected to. I was too young to fight in Vietnam, but I was very connected to the people that that did have to go, and so I was really intrigued by a, a few stories that I had read about, and I thought I, it would make for good uh, a good backdrop for. For Scott's character. How different was the final episode from what you wrote, if any? It was fairly different. Um, I think, yeah, the biggest thing that changed was, I, and I have to really go back in my brain, but I don't believe I actually put Bigfoot or a monster in my episode. And that got added. That was, you know, through the staff that got added, whatever wisdom they came up with to add that character. But I can remember... Scott being really unhappy about that, and uh, and I he thought I did it. He thought I was the one that put that in there. He felt like it wasn't true to the form. Um, I didn't tell him that wasn't I, but I remember him saying something to me about that. I mean, he was, a, he was the protector of the the storylines at that point, so I understood why he would have an issue. Um, it's just that I I wasn't the one who added it. That was something. That was a decision that was made internally. But I agreed with Scott. I did. I wasn't. You know, it was more. It was meant to be more of the metaphor. Watching it myself, I feel like it was almost put in there for just for the preview to get people to watch the next episode. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I respect. I respected Scott's opinion. I don't know. I felt the same way. But I think anybody who writes, you know, they, they always want to have their own words up there or whatever. But I also believe in. I believe in the, the greater consciousness of the room and for lots of reasons. Um, but I'm just really glad that I had the opportunity to do it. It was a joy. Uh, the director, I didn't know very well. I can't remember his name. And I, that was a disappointment to me. Not that he not that he was a disappointment, but I knew all the other regular directors and I would have loved to have had that rapport upset. Um, and I didn't really get to enjoy that because he didn't really know me. And you know, the, the life of the director can sometimes be the life of a journeyman. And so they're just trying to make sure they get the show in on time and all that. But um, yeah, so I kind of missed that. I was spoiled by knowing and loving some of the other directors on the show. The regulars. What was it like to work with uh, Scott Bakula, Dean Stockwell? How did they treat you? And uh, did it change after being on the show so many times? Yes. I um, spoke with Dean Stockwell, who I believe is of Italian origin. I, I never really looked into it. But uh, the only thing I can remember is he was, he was a little with me, kind of cool with me, kind of a cool character in general, but uh, and cool in the, in, in the right sense of the word. But he was extremely warm and open with my mom and dad who came to visit us one time. And so uh, I guess he felt uh, some sort of connection and maybe there was an Italian roots connection there. I don't know, but um, I was delighted that he was kind and warm to my parents. Um, Scott was very good to me on set and a great leader. He taught me how to be a great leader. 
I learned a lot from him. So when it was when I had a show in the future, or if I, you know, I always followed Scott's model. I'll never forget him. Just he worked. He worked with every. He helped everybody on set. Uh, and on some days, I would see him, you know, pulling the cables across the electrical cables, whatever he, he could do. He was a great captain of that show. So I'm, I'm, I wish him well, and he deserves all the, the good things that are happening for him. He's got some good things happening lately too. Yeah, he's got uh, what NCIS New Orleans, I think, mm-hmm. coming up. Yeah, yeah. Going back to Frank Lamada, was there a difference in your character, or if any, what was the difference between Jimmy and Deliver Us from Evil? Did you feel the character was different a couple years later? Without having just watched the shows, I'm going to give a stab at that. I mean, obviously, there was the whole psychological pull behind the scenes of um, and, you know, the evil leaper. So, no, I, I think that you know, I was trying to show maybe a realistic version of what could happen to people over the course of time. Uh, the initial character really resonated with me. Just, you know, he was in... <laughs> He was in a no-win situation everywhere he went, just trying to help raise his brother. And it was just a super empathetic, sympathetic character that was meant a lot to me, but it, it also meant that character meant a lot to the fans of the show. And um, and so did Bradley. Bradley was, you know, he had all of their hearts. Scott was brilliant in it. And um, I think the thing that resonates for me is when I was a kid, there was a, a boy who was retarded. I'll just use the word. And then he would come to our street and he would want to show, he was older than us, and he would want to show us his monster magazines because that was the cool thing. And when he would appear on our dead end street, the first mother who saw him on the street would shout and scream and all the mothers would yell for all of us to come in. Get in the house! Get in the house! Because they were afraid it was contagious. It seems kind of silly nowadays silly and sad and just frightening it's frightening and sad so i really had that memory with me the whole way through that show and um the show took place in the early 60s so it was something that was really close to me and pain it was a painful memory for me to think about it especially now um but yeah so frank lamato really resonated with me and he was not getting the support of his wife at home he was mom and dad had passed on he's got this brother he's trying to get him work He's trying to keep his own job, and then he fails at that. So he had a lot going against him. It's a great character to play. And Jimmy Whitmore Jr. directed it. Um, we had a great cast, and everybody did their job. So everybody looked good in it. He did Michael Madsen, ultimately. <laughs> yeah. And then but the next one, I remember. I, I can't remember the ladies' names offhand. I'll say Renee uh, was one of them. But uh, really great actresses. I can't remember the name of the, the lady that played the evil leaper. And then she had her Dean Stockwell version, uh, the English actress. And they were a lot of fun. Um, and yet, you know, they put Scott's character in a real bind again. And um, anyway, so I don't know if I can make a proper comparison without you having just watched. The final episode was the trip. Were you honored to be invited to do that in the, in the last episode? Like, did yeah, you? very much so. Very much so. And to be invited in this, if you're part of the family at that point. And uh, it was so nice to do it with Bradley. And yeah, but it was such a, a you know, Don, Don's going to push the boundaries and like, a wonderful psychological drama. And yeah, it was different than what I expected for sure. Very different. The Sopranos needed one like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you have an opinion on the ending? Uh, a lot of the fans are split between whether they love it or hate it. Um, I think I would be in favor of it. I think most of us have a theme about never being able to get home, you know, and I think there's some reality in there for all of us. So, And Deliver Us From Evil, when you walk in and your character thinks Jimmy was just trying to rape Connie, was that difficult for you to, I don't know, it was very, it looked very emotional, and uh, was that hard for you to do, that scene? Well, I'm going to say yes. I have to go back to my, years ago that is, but anytime there's a scene like that, it's really, really hard. And I think what's, you have to remove yourself from the the, the viewer, and you, I have to go into the body of the person who's having those feelings, and then I have to stay there for a duration of time until we get that shot completely. So I got to be. Uh, I like to think that you st- the actor stays warm to the subject matter, so that he can launch or she can launch into it, 
I heard with Heath Ledger on Batman that he would be telling jokes in the chairs and then just go up to the set. But I do think that, from, uh, technically, from Max's point of view, even though I feel he did a genius job, sometimes it's a little different. Sometimes it's you have to really stay in the world of the character for a while longer in order to find a real truth there, maybe a more subtle truth. Um, do you remember, uh, I know it's 25 years ago, probably at this point, maybe, was that scene filmed in uh, like two different days on two different days? Did you have to go back? I couldn't tell you what happened last week. Right? <laughs> so I, don't have no, I have no idea. I'm the same way, so no idea. I know what you're saying. You have been in so many great television series that everybody has seen. You made the rounds in the 90s in the sci-fi and the shows that I watched anyway, so you're very recognizable to me. Like Sliders, that was a good part you did where you played the bad guy in Virtual Slide. Uh, I'm sure our listeners would uh, not be happy with me if I didn't ask you about Sequest DSV. <laughs> um, yes, that was amazing. Tommy Thompson, I mentioned earlier, um, was offered the helm of running that show. And I, it was a lot of politics going on behind the scenes uh, between Tommy and well, it's, uh, too much information to give out. But um, Tommy wanted to put a character on the show that had a sense of humor, and in particular, his sense of humor, which is phenomenal. Uh, and he knew that I could deliver that. But I literally, I went to him and said, Tommy, don't do this because you know, make sure you get in there, get comfortable. I, didn't want, I truly did not want him thinking about me. I wanted him to have a, a great ride because Steven Spielberg had picked him for the, for the journey. You know, it was quite an honor. Um, but he was convinced that the show needed some levity. And so he wanted to bring me in as sort of an instant pulver character. That began one of the, the hardest... <laughs> most challenging audition processes I ever went through because there was a camp of people who wanted anybody but John D'Aquino for that role because I was associated with Tommy. And some of those people that were in that camp were higher up. I was actually shooting on the set of Quantum Leap during this process. So I was in one of those episodes. I can't remember if it was the final one. It must have been the final one. And um, so I was on the Universal lot anyway. And it got so contentious that um, about three days before the audition, NBC calls up uh, my agents and said, please make sure John knows he'll have some friends in the room. That's how ugly it got. <laughs> Never heard that one before. And uh, and then when I walked into the room, there was a, it was a I, knew, I knew at least five of the people that didn't want me, and there was a handful, I guess it did. And I was sitting there and in the lobby and watching everybody walk into the room. There was about 17 people in that room that day. And I remember thinking, wow, if I don't let go of this anger, um, you know, this, this feeling of being hurt by what people have said, people don't even know me. I don't have a chance of making anybody smile in that room. So I literally spent that time in the lobby just um, kind of almost in a prayer, like forgiving people, forgiving those people and just making peace with them before walking in. And I was able to walk in lightly and I looked people in the eye and I called them by their first names to make sure that they understood that I was a human being. And uh, I was very relaxed. I had a great time in the room and it ultimately came my way. And I found out while on set. I remember telling Scott about it as a matter of fact. Yeah. I'm glad you got that. That show and uh, I want to say Star Trek Next Generation were the two shows back then I couldn't miss. Oh, that's really nice of you to say. What character do you get recognized for the most? Because you've done so many things. Well, ironically, well, a lot of people from the Seinfeld episode, yeah. all the aficionados of Seinfeld, that'll happen. My character's name is Todd Gack, and some people will call me Gack. Hmm. <laughs> but a mailman, I had a substitute mailman one day, he goes, you're Gack. You're Gack, man. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes. And, uh, and then a lot of people from Quantum Leap, but quite frankly, it's mostly... Uh, the kids, and they all know me as the president of the United States from Corey in the House, which is a Disney show, which was the spinoff of That's So Raven. And Rondell Sheridan, the comedian, who, actor, director, great guy, um, he played the father of Raven on That's So Raven, and he was also on this program. And he said to me, get ready, your life's going to change. And I was actually teaching, I have an acting school, and I was teaching 18 and above up until that time. And afterward, everything changed. I started getting invited to teach a lot of kids. I first, I remember visiting some schools. I can't remember, I think I was in the Midwest. And the show had been on for a little while. And this group of kids came up to me and said, can we hug you? And I'm like, uh, 
yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, so I'd never, uh, I never anticipated that I would be embraced by children in that way. And it was really fantastic. And I was, uh, so it's been a part of me that wanted to do, to be a little league coach, to be a, a life coach for kids. But I couldn't understand how it was going to, to really happen outside of my own kids. And uh, all of a sudden, in the last six or seven years, the school has been really blossomed. And we have a, a really good school for young actors in L.A. We go from ages six to 26, basically. Um, we make movies. We literally bring in professional crews. We make original movies. We give a lot of kids uh, opportunity to learn. And we have a, a large number of success stories. We've got some kids that have their own shows. We just had, um, well, I can go on about that, but I'm not sure if I want to talk about some kids specifically, but we have kids that have their own shows. One, one or two have movie careers. One is about to have a major movie career. Um, and so, you know, eventually you're going to have your successes, I guess, regardless, but it, it feels good. And then it also feels good for those kids that will never be professional actors, but love it. Um, and just, they really just want to learn the craft and we try and introduce them to all aspects of the industry because I don't want them to turn out victims to and just being actors. I want them to, you know, develop as writers, producers. I mean, I'll cheer the loudest when one of my kids becomes a studio executive. I'm going to really get a kick in on that one. But already, some of our students are having lunches together at the commissary, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, how can people find out more about that? Uh, I have a website, johndiacrino.net. So, you know, I will say that it, we we are a school for professionally-minded kids, and we have kids coming in from around the world now, actually. But um, we're fun, we're, but we're, we're not easy. So, you know, we try and make sure that everybody understands that the goal is prime time or film. And so we're going, we really try and have a, have a very ambitious curriculum to, to, that resembles the professional world of show business. So in addition to learning how to become an actor, you really, and this is some place where I'm I stepped in it a lot of times. You have to learn set etiquette, set protocol. I will, you know, I can't go into it, but there was, there was about four incidents in my career where, um, I'll say very well established actors try to hurt my career. And I really feel that these were middle aged guys who were threatened on some level. It happens to ladies all the time. But I can remember it happening to me clearly and saying to myself, I will never be that person in my middle ages. And if anything, I will, I will reach out. I will mentor and I'll do what I can because it's not easy. And there's no manual for this. And we spend a lot of time trying to create some sort of manual for how to be what's expected, be a good guest on set, et cetera, et cetera. I was reading your biography and I noticed it had said that one of your teachers uh, early on was Charles Nelson Riley. Yeah. Could you tell me uh, more about your uh, relationship with Charles Nelson Riley and how amazing that must have been? <laughs> uh, that was a gift from heaven. That's that's a very special man, and anybody who studied with him feels the same way I do, and we're all very blessed. A lot of us became teachers because of Charles, because he taught us that initially, if you love the craft, the craft will love you back. And and we all did. We never even asked about when do we get a job. We just devoted everything to our classes, to our work, and then eventually the work would find us because we became talented. We all developed our skill sets. There's been a lot of people that became actors, writers, producers, directors. As a matter of fact, John Hawks. And he has, he has a great career, but he was the guy in the back of you know, the class. And hardly, you know, came in periodically and he would always do something a little bit tweaked, a little bit different. And uh, I think it, it probably took him the longest, but he's gone really far subsequent to that. Um, Charles was the most giving person you've ever met. He was he rooted for the underdog. We could be invited to a meal with luminaries, not only stars, but luminaries from any any part of the world. We'd be invited to these dinners because he would always want to incorporate us. And he would celebrate you. If he just met you, he would celebrate you. And at a table at the finest restaurant in Beverly Hills, he would bring the waiter over and make sure that everybody at the table knew who this waiter was or who the, who the boss boy was or who the waitress was. Tell me about yourself, you know, and he would celebrate that person and make sure everybody understood that this person had value. This person was special and important as well. It was amazing. Um, and a gifted teacher, class was like church. 
killing can say. Clay, you know, he would disarm you with, he was the funniest human I'd ever met. And I, I got to hang out with some great ones. And uh, the great comedians wanted to hang out with him. He would make them laugh. And he would disarm you with his humor. And then he would just level you with his passion. And so we learned both. We learned both. Do you have any uh, little funny stories or anything that happened on the set of your time on Quantum Leap that you could tell the listeners? Mm, let me see here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, okay, there is there's a few funny stories. Well, uh, it, it actually didn't happen on the set. It happened as a result of Quantum Leap. I was proposed to um, by somebody on a bluff in England who, <laughs> who, yeah, I really liked my character. Um, yeah. So, and it was, uh, I had gone to a quantum leap event. I won't say where. And, uh, well, I guess I said England and <laughs> I ended up getting proposed to. And that was, that was nice. That was nice. I didn't accept, but it was nice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So thank you, quantum leap. <laughs> Sounds flattering. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Honor talking to you. Be well. Be okay. well. Thank you.